today. I have my son Carl here to help me with my uh, Greek and uh, scripture verses to make sure I'm on the straight and narrow here, and he's going to help me uh, stay uh, accurate. Now, now look, we are in a really unique season in history right now where God is doing something that is shaking up everything. And we were starting last week. This is part two of a message on the signet ring anointing. And we started last week talking about how the signet ring is, a, is an artifact that God himself brings in to focus in the prophet Haggai who refers to a great shaking that comes to the earth in the last days where the heavens and the earth will both shake. And Haggai says, this is the Lord of hosts speaking. He says it like six times. The word host means angelic armies. God's angelic armies are at work in the shaking that is going on in the world right now. And it's happening in heaven and on earth. On earth, it's nations and economies and wars and kingdoms. But in the heavens, it's principalities and powers. And since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, Hell itself is under siege, and that's where the shaking is. So when you're looking at circumstances on earth, rather than being distressed by what you see, recognize that it's the evidence that God is shaking things up, as Haggai prophesied. And he prophesied it on uh, October 6, 520 B.C., the same day that Hamas attacked Israel. Because it specifies in the Bible in Haggai chapter 2, that on this 21st day of the seventh month, which is the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, that's exactly when the inhabitants of Gaza, which was formerly Philistia, or the, where the Philistines were. You have a modern-day Philistinian, Philistine attack on the Jews. History is moving in its cycles. But the Bible said, in that day, I'm going to raise up Zerubbabel, a unique kind of a end time believer and I'm going to give to you the signet ring because you've been chosen and so we've been looking at this signet ring anointing I want you to go to uh, Lance Wallnau W-A-L-L-N-A-U dot com forward slash signet S-I-G-N-E-T and you want to get a hold of this unique teaching because I think it's I have not heard it taught any place else so it's not like I'm knocking this off this is a revelation that came to me when I was reading about the shaking and, the, and the, the, the role of Zerubbabel, and I realized this is an end time verse, and it's happening now. Uh, you can call 1-800-910-6349 or write the number down. Right now, if you've got a pen, 1-800-910-6349, and make sure you get the signet ring anointing. So we're, we're in this... In this uh, understanding that the signet ring was a ring that was worn by royalty in a period where they didn't have credit cards. So how did you authorize a document? How did you seal a treaty? How did you mark a transaction so that the court would say you sold a property? And it was done by a ring that would be worn by those who were considered to be royalty with high authority and the ring would have an insignia of detail regarding the house uh, uh, that was like the house of Judah or the house of Pharaoh so that it, it represented a specific dynasty. And the ring would go into wax. And so you take that ring and push it right into the wax, hold it there, and pull it out. And the wax would congeal and solidify the seal of the house. So the signet ring was an early form of credit card, only operated by those that had enough assets to afford to have a ring that would be used by who? A trusted servant. So Pharaoh, we found out, was the first instance of this ring being given to Joseph. And we also found out that when a signet ring is given in the law of first mention, the first time it's mentioned in the Bible, there's authority with parameters, meaning... The signet ring anointing is your authorization to act as the ambassador of Christ in a situation where God has defined the perimeter of your focus and given you the power to get results in that area. And so we, we, we ask, you know, well, 
obviously in the New Testament, we, we don't really see Jesus handing out signet rings, but it's, it's a spiritual parallel. It's kind of like when the Bible talks about, David says, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod and staff are symbols of God's authority and God's role. The signet ring is a symbol. And we found it, and Carl, if you could uh, refresh our memory, it's in John, uh, you know, Haggai chapter 2, where the Lord says, Zerubbabel, I've chosen you, and I'm giving you the signet ring uh, in order to do the work I've called you to do. Then we go to John to see what does this correspond to in the New Testament, and what do we got in John 15? John 15, 16, it says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. You're chosen in order to produce certain results. Mm -hmm. Fruit refers to results. So you could say Jesus is talking to the apostles, and he's saying, you didn't choose me. I chose you for this task. You, end time Zerubbabel, who, by the way, was a governor, not a prophet or a priest or a teacher, but a secular marketplace individual. God says, I chose you out of all the people in order that you could be appointed to get results in a certain vineyard. There's fruit that I want. There's results that I want. I'm going to reveal to you where that vineyard is and when you get there, the signet ring of my name, you can imprint my name on the soft wax of the situation, and if you release it with the appropriate authority and faith, boom, you'll imprint my authority and things will start to happen. And you'll get what you need and your joy will be full because you're going to see answered prayer. I, I think this is, this is, I think it's, it's I want to say mind-blowing, but as I'm, I'm as I'm, in this revelation, I'm realizing that a lot of our frustration is because we might be asking in areas that God hasn't authorized us. You know, you got people that are, and I've seen this happen, you're, you're praying for a national thing and it doesn't happen. And you're decreeing and you're praying. But listen, uh, if God anointed you for a national thing, that's one thing. But if God has authorized you for a certain assignment in a certain field, your batting average is going to be a lot better if you're praying and asking in the area of fruit that he's authorized you to be in. I remember uh, Bob Mumford, a great teacher years ago, said if you, uh, if you want to increase your success in answered prayer, stop swinging at everything that gets thrown over the plate. In other words, if you're swinging at balls that God is sending, you're going to have fouls and strikes and, you know, but if you actually are swinging at the ball God sends, you're in the lane of what he's authorized you to do. So we know that uh, prayer is part of the signet ring, asking in the name of Jesus, because the name of Jesus is the authorization. But it's not just asking. There's another aspect of this. And, uh, and we find it in the speaking to the situation. I'm challenged by the words that Jesus said that, you know, you shall say, if you have faith, you shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea. But there again, it was while we were doing our last Bible study. Get your Bible for this. This is going to, you're going to get a lot out of this. If you got your Bible, mark these things down. And I was thinking, wait a second. So Rubable has something about a mountain also. It would make a lot of sense if we went there and we went, uh, Carl, we went to Zechariah chapter 4, and uh, Zechariah 4, and we were reading verses uh, 6 and 7, and it, 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 it's where the prophet, is, Zechariah, is prophesying something to Zerubbabel, and uh, read verse 6 and, and catch up with what we're, what we're trying to catch here. 
Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. So the mountain that is in front of Zerubbabel, which is what? The mountain of resistance to his Assignment And what was Zerubbabel's assignment? His assignment was to rebuild the glorious temple. He had a role to play in restoring the temple that was torn down by Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians. And, and it says that there's going to be shouts of grace, grace. So you may feel like, well, I don't have that big a track record. I don't have any power. I don't have any money. I don't have any influence. You see, here's the point. If you're chosen like those fishermen were chosen by Jesus and appointed by Jesus to go get results, all you got to know is where have you called me to produce the results because it's not by my might nor by my power but by the authorization of your anointing, your name and your will, I will go do what you call me to do and your name will go into the wax of that situation. I will speak to God in prayer and ask in Jesus' name and I'm going to get what I need. Then I'm going to speak to the situation and command it, mountain, move. And the grace of God, Interesting thing about grace is we, we frequently use the word grace. We think of grace as being like, uh, when I think of somebody giving grace, I think of it kind of like, you know, cutting slack or, you know, give me some grace. But the actual, the actual word for grace is not cut me some slack. Paul said, when I labored, it wasn't me, but the grace of God that was with me. The grace refers to a steady current of divine power. Think of that. Think of plugging an outlet, boom. And the grace is the steady current of divine power. Why do I know that the Bible is talking about grace as a divine power versus um, a um, cutting me some slack? Because the Bible says that uh, grace and truth came by Jesus and he was filled with grace. So grace couldn't be God cutting Jesus slack. It was God giving him a steady current of divine power. So the uh, grace is, uh, the shouts are going to be shouts that God's divine power is going to do this. Not my might, not my power, but the power of the anointing. Make sense so far? So, so all this fits together profoundly when we think about the, um, the role of the signet ring being authorized in your life. You want to, once again, get the signet ring anointing. It's lancewalmart.com forward slash signet, S-I-G-N-E-T. Call 800-910-6349 and you want to get a hold of this powerful teaching. Now, the, uh, Jesus gives the power of his name. But there's a third aspect of this that I, I think we need to talk about. And Carl, see if you can find it where Jesus uh, tells the disciples to go forth and minister. And when they come back, they find that even the demons are subject unto them. So we have a third aspect of the commanding. This isn't asking God. This isn't speaking to the situation. This is speaking to the demons or the devil that's involved with the situation. It's the third aspect of what I want to talk about with the signet ring anointing. And where is that verse? Luke 10, 17. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And then Jesus says, verse 19, check this out. What does it say? Verse 19, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Verse 20, Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Woo! Well, there's something in there I should talk about. 
the spirits are subject to you. Subject to you where? Well, generally, the spirits are subject to you. But remember the swinging at every ball over the plate? Uh, read chapter 10, verse 1. What does Jesus say? Chapter 10, verse 1. Of Luke. After these things, the Lord appointed over other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. All right, stop and see this. Jesus gives you the authority to have spirits subject unto you or demons submitted to your authority when you're going into every place that he sends you because he himself is going to go there. God's going to go before you. God's going to go with you. God's going to follow up behind you. When you go where God sends you, you're swinging at the right ball. And when you do that, you're going to see, a, you're going to see that you have authority not only to pray and get prayers answered, but to speak to the situation, speak to the, the, the sickness. And then if there's a demon involved, the demon will have to submit to you because your speaking is not to the situation only, but to the spirit behind the situation. You catch that? A lot of problems are the demons behind the situation. And you can really wear yourself out. I don't know, have you ever had that happen with somebody that keeps on, you have to keep delivering them over and over again from a circumstance? Because if they don't have authority over the demons that are operating and influencing them, they're going to keep on repeating the same pattern. And the devil will wear you out unless you deal with the demons. So, um, but as, as I'm looking at this, there's an aspect of the signet ring anointing, which has to do with the harvest. Because Jesus does say right there in verse 2, he's sending them forth, uh, and he's sending them forth to the harvest. The laborers are few. There are very few people that are skillful in the administration of what God's calling them to do in the harvest fields he's sending them. But I want, I want to share with you a thought that is especially important and practical because I taught you about speaking to the situation or the mountain, speaking to the demons. We're going to cover that a little more. Speaking to God, the signet ring, which is the, 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 the soft wax of the situation imprinted by the authority of the signet ring or your authority to represent Christ in that situation. But when it comes to people, that's where the harvest is. How does the signet ring anointing impact the harvest? People. And that's where we go to Acts chapter 2. We're going to see the, the most probably uh, relevant new piece of material I'm giving you today on the signet ring anointing. So, Carl, in Acts chapter 2, we have Peter on the day of Pentecost filled with the Holy Spirit, and he is speaking to the, the Jews there who are assembled as the Spirit of God is making this noise and they're, they're drawn to it. And uh, where is the verse that, that describes the impact of Peter's words on them? Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, the Lord said, said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. All right, so here, here catch this. Peter is preaching this sermon. Do you think it was the sermon that pierced their heart? You could, the sermon's right here. You could read it. You could go next Sunday, get in a pulpit and say, I have a word from the Lord. Read Peter's sermon. And I don't think you're going to get the same result. You know why? Because the signet ring anointing is the ability to fix the impression that God is speaking through you into the soft wax 
of the human heart so that when you're speaking under this anointing of God speaking through you, it imprints on the heart the word of God and the wrestling and the, the impact of that going down deep into the inside of a person causes a response uh, on, on inside of them. Now, the word for pricked, my translation, which is the New King James says, now when they had heard this in verse 37, they were cut to the heart and, uh, they, and, 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 and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what, what must we do? They, they were penetrated. Do you have, Carl, the Greek word for pricked to the heart or cut to the heart? Do you have it there? What is it? I do. It's katanusa. The definition is to prick violently. Uh, another way to describe it is pained, emotionally pierced through, psychologically pricked, emotionally stunned. And the, and the root word there for the, for the kata, what is it again? Katanusa. Katanusa. The root word kata means to bear down. So it means to push down thoroughly into the heart. It's that ring going all the way to the conscience. If you want to know why America is in the condition it's in, why we're in the condition we're in, it's because the conscience is that apparatus on the inside of us that, that is the witness to the truth and that is both weighing and judging us in the light of that truth. And when your words go deep into the conscience of people, it fixes an impression. Now, the re that language, fixing an impression, is very intentional. I referred last week to... Charles Finney, a great evangelist, probably, arguably, along with Billy Graham, one of the greatest evangelists the United States has ever seen. Although Finney had more success than Billy Graham because Billy Graham admitted that 90% of his converts that came down to the altar calls in his big arenas, that if you went back a year or two later, you wouldn't see a whole lot of evidence. Finney had about a 70 or 80% retention based on what historians say about his labors. His fruit remained. Now, here's what Finney said. He said that when he was saved, he was a lawyer. And when he was saved, he was seeking God and God visited him. And when God visited him, he said he felt as though it was like immense angel wings fanning him. And he was filled with the spirit of God so um, dramatically that he begged God to stop lest he die from that visitation. And he said he believes that what happened to him was Jesus telling the disciples, tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. You've been with me for three years. I breathed into you and you've received the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, but you're not ready yet. You must wait until you are baptized in the Spirit. When you receive power from on high, then go forth and preach. The book of Acts, chapter 2, that Carl just read, that was right when they were visited, just like Finney. And the Spirit of God had so filled Peter that when he spoke his words that were delivered there in uh, 30 verses, pierced the heart of 2,000 people, and they surrendered. My God, what do I got to do? So Finney said that he went forth and he would pray. And when his, he prayed with that endowment of power, his prayers were very powerful. And when he went forth ministering and visiting people and preaching, he said it was as though a sword was piercing. Sometimes people just fell out of their seats and just in agony, they fell to the floor. And he thought, whoa. And then he said something which I believe is, is so convicting because he described what most of us live in. He said, I went forth and continued to preach and to witness and to pray and had no effect. After having an effect and then having no effect, he said, I went and besought the Lord to inquire as to the reason for the lifting of that power. And he said, and I would take a day or two. I'd fast and pray, and invariably the Lord would put his finger on something. 
than he had to deal with. And then the moment I yielded on that point, the power came back in all its freshness. And I went forth to labor with power. And then he said something. This has been the experience of my life. I have to admit, when I read that, and I am I'm sharing with you with conviction right now, because I've had long stretches of time when I, I minister without seeing that, that effect. And yet what convicts me is people will come back to me, keep, will come to me as I travel in 30 or 40 years doing this, and they'll come back and they'll remind me of a prophecy I gave or a teaching I gave that imprinted on them such an impression that it altered their trajectory. It was a seven mountain teaching. And very often it's on, it's on teaching like this, which is why I want you to get the signet ring anointing, lancewalnut.com forward slash signet, S-I-G-N-E-T, because it was what I was teaching or preaching. It had the signet ring penetrating power and it, they couldn't shake the impression. Some of them went on and switched careers. They ended careers. They, they went in a whole different direction because the seven mountain message at that time, boom, delivered with a certain anointing that, that left a lasting impression. Finney said this, what was it they received in the upper room? He said, you could say it was tongues. He said, but what was it about the tongues? It was the fact that God had given them the power of utterance, the ability to speak under the inspiration of the fire of God. And when they spoke, it produced an impact. When you're speaking under that anointing, the demons move. When you're praying under that anointing, the prayers go through. When you're talking to the situation with that anointing, the situation changes. But here's the other piece. When you're testifying and ministering with the signet ring anointing, your words go in like uh, the authority of the word of God into the wax of people's hearts. And when you pull that ring out, they're impacted by the testimony. That's the part I want you to catch. Well, we only have uh, one minute and 11 seconds here, and I, I have so much more I want to cover right now. I, I didn't go to the board. I wanted to go over to the board. I got to get to the board to show you how this works. But we'll do that in the next, in the next, um, the next episode that I do with you. So what I want you to do now is I want you to get a hold of the Signet Ring, lancewalnut.com forward slash Signet, 1-800-910-6349. And uh, we're going to talk about how the signet ring anointing shows up. You'll see it in the life of Daniel. You're going to see it in the life of Joseph. You're going to see it in the end time ministry of Zerubbabel, which I'm saying you have. Uh, and, and I believe that we're going to see it in the story of Esther, where Mordecai is given the signet ring of the king in order to reverse the curse of Haman. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, for everyone watching this broadcast right now, I ask you to visit everyone here with the mighty power of your Holy Spirit, just like Charles Finney. Visit them, Lord, with angels' wings and fan them with your breath as they read these words. May they pierce their hearts and produce an army of Zerubbabel's with a signet ring anointing. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you enjoy this latest episode? Please remember to share it with your friends because the more knowledge you have, the better equipped you are to navigate the world.